in a stir so that would be. Uh, uh, five minutes is not a lot of time, so I'll just quickly run through uh, what I want to say. Uh, it's, it's, I think, obvious that we have to share the uh, pessimism of, uh, of Dr. Raja Mohan and, uh, and uh, Chibar Sahab, because if you compare the high water mark of 2015 with um, what's unfolding now, and I was just doing a quick checklist of um, what all is unraveling. It's, it's not a pretty list. Uh, we're familiar with the WTO, where the US essentially uh, uh, was walking away from uh, its uh, engagement, uh, believes that the dispute resolution mechanism uh, is stacked against it, uh, and is preferring uh, clearly uh, to pursue uh, more unilateral uh, solutions. Um, on the uh, climate change walk back is well known. I don't need any, uh, doesn't need any repetition here. The, uh, on the geopolitical plane, uh, the uh, high water, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if the JCPOA was 2015 or 2016, but 2015, that's uh, also the product of that year, the Iran uh, deal between, uh, you know, with the uh, E3 plus 3 and uh, and Iran, so this, uh, you know, finally putting uh, U.S.-Iran relations and the West relations with Iran on an even keel. Uh, by all accounts, a win-win agreement today uh, jeopardized unnecessarily by the Trump administration. Uh, DPRK, uh, you know, you have no less a person than the U.N. Secretary General Guterres uh, at the Munich conference yesterday urging the U.S. to not walk away from the prospect of dialogue with DPRK simply because the situation is so fragile. Then you have Trump unilaterally discarding a key tenet of what has been the multilateral approach to the Middle East peace process by uh, declaring Jerusalem as the capital. Uh, so, you know, is issues that were, then you, of course you have, you have Brexit. So the one uh, poster child, if you will, of making borders irrelevant uh, today, uh, a question mark of sorts hanging over it. Uh, the jury is out on, uh, it's not as if things are unremittingly negative. There are still uh, works in progress as far as uh, cyber security, for example, is concerned, uh, where uh, multilateral processes are underway uh, after a fashion. And you also have uh, uh, unilateral multilateralism, which is what I would call a Belt Road Initiative, One Belt, One Road, where uh, you know, an attempt is being made to uh, to fashion something again, you know, Chibra Sam is right that the Chinese are very careful to uh, to play by the rules uh, or to uh, create that impression of playing by the rules, uh, so that you'd be hard pressed to find, with the possible exception of CPEC, uh, any tenet of international law that the Belt Road Initiative is upending, uh, and even there, the rest of the world may not agree with our assessment of CPEC either. But uh, uh, this is an example, uh, I would say of some attempt to uh, take the multilateral approach. And it underlines, to my mind, uh, a key <laughs> quality of multilateralism that uh, we tend to ignore because we universally regard multilateralism as a positive, which it is. But multilateralism as part of the world system is, uh, to my mind, inseparable from hegemony. And in the Gramscian sense, where we define hegemony as, uh, as, a, as an arrangement that uh, those who are the subjects of this hegemony willingly subscribe to because it, 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 it gives them something in return. Uh, multilateralism at all its different phases, but particularly uh, in the high, the high watermark phase of the end of the Cold War, uh, was a system which, where the US uh, believed it could further its interests. Uh, and uh, but which also afforded opportunities to countries like like India and lots of other middle powers to also pursue their interests. And it isn't surprising that multilateralism begins to run today's fashion to blame Trump for everything. But I would say that multilateralism begins to run into trouble and begins to unravel at some point a few years after the Doha round starts, uh, when the U.S. realizes that it cannot fully have its way with the development round. Uh, on, on the political plane, the utility of the Security Council from, in American eyes 
uh, is not what it was once 2003 the UNSC refused to endorse the legalization of Iraq. Uh, even the American ability to use different international institutions in order to enforce or create a new order once it had destroyed existing orders in Iraq or Libya has, uh, has proved to be uh, uh, an illusion, a chimera, a chimera. The US is not able to uh, essentially use international arrangements and its domination over them in order to push for new arrangements in order to enforce the new order. So, uh, in a way, the current demise of multilateralism with the US leading the charge shouldn't surprise us and we should not overly associate it just with Trump. Uh, because I think uh, the, the limits of multilateralism as a hegemonic strategy was breached perhaps seven or eight years ago, ten years ago, and the retreat from that from the US side began around then, even if its manifestations were not always obvious. Um, we are today at a dangerous moment. Uh, uh, Dr. Raja Mohan mentioned the different phases of multilateralism. Uh, what's similar between the phase we are in today and the interwar period is that you have an accentuation of big power rivalry uh, coming at the same time as you have the rise of unstable regimes in many of the important parts. Uh, today I would, I would say, and when I mean unstable I don't mean danger of regime collapsing, but when, uh, when regimes move away from settled principles, civilizational values, uh, 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 you know, uh, when they turn towards hyper-nationalism as many uh, uh, regimes are doing, I think that this uh, makes the uh, international environment even more volatile. And uh, I'm afraid today we are in that period where uh, you have uh, you know, the gloves coming off, the rivalry between India and the US, uh, the US and China. Uh, at a time when uh, domestically you have uh, virtually all equations getting re-examined and getting answered. Uh, for India, the challenge to my mind uh, in negotiating this difficult domain uh, would involve two things. One, uh, for us to be absolutely clear that uh, in looking for new solutions and looking for new arrangements, we don't give up values, principles that have stood the country well for the past 70 years. Uh, in pursuit of narrow political goals. I think that's absolutely essential. And the second, uh, uh, equally important, we are not stop on this, that uh, one should be extremely guarded at this moment uh, of flux in uh, not uh, getting associated with one power or the other. Uh, you have a power rivalry and uh, happening. India has to play that game carefully, but getting sucked into uh, a conflict between powers or choosing sides or attempting to play one against the other uh, uh, is sometimes fraught with danger and perhaps India would be well advised to keep off some of this run. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth.